Thank you so much for coming and chatting about this. I've got it right here. Yay. I love it. It's so, so good. And I also love, I love all the pictures because growing up and being a Bananarama fam, it's just really nice to look back and be reminded of all these amazing, iconic moments. I once went to a party um, as you, I only, there was only one of me. So I was going as kind of a mix of the three of you. And I had a rara <laughs> skirt, a lot of hairspray, back combing and a black hat. That was basically how I became Bananarama. Quite a combo, a combination of all our looks thrown together in one beautiful piece. That was it. I wondered though, I mean, when you were, when, when it was kind of like the heyday, God, you must've used a lot of hairspray. Yes, absolutely. I mean, yeah, tons and tons of it. Yeah. Like, we didn't go out unless our hair was massive. I love it's a that. It's idea, isn't it, really? I don't use it at all now. Sarah, Sarah, I think, wrote in the book when she, there was a moment of madness and she had a lighter on match and Siobhan's hair went up. That was at college, yeah. She had so much spray on it. <laughs> God, right, okay, well, yeah, so maybe it's best to stay away from that about yeah. all the time. And um, I also, because I knew I was chatting to you today, I just thought in the house last night, I, I played some of your music and do you know what? You forget how every single song is just so brilliant and such iconic tunes, but still to this day, I mean, everyone knows the songs and they're just so good. When you look back, which is your favorite? Is it easy? Can you choose one? Um. It is quite surprising how many there are, and um, even sort of doing a TV or something where they play loads of, of our tracks, I think, wow, yes, and, and they're fun and they make you happy and they have good memories. I think they all remind us of different things. I loved Cruel Summer because it was our first top 10 in the States. Um, Robert De Niro, because it's just such a quirky, odd song. Um, Venus, Loving the First Degree. I can't really choose one. I just. No, it is quite difficult. I mean, I like I like the earlier stuff because it's a it's a bit different and a bit odd. But then, I loved all the Stock Aitken Waterman stuff we did. I mean, it was just such a joyous time um, promoting it and and stuff you could properly sort of dance to as well. It was, pro it was the first time we went into sort of dance pop, I think. But you were one of the early Stock Aitken Waterman signings as well, before all the Kylies and Jasons and all that. It was yeah. it was you guys. And and d is it true that they didn't they didn't want you to do Venus? Yes, yes. Um, they had had very little success at that point. So we were all well, we had had success. So we co-wrote with them. I think that was the sort of difference between the acts that followed. But um, we suggested Venus because we we rehearsed it right back in the day. And they were like, oh, no, that's not going to work. And the record company said, no, no, I don't think that'll work. And then we, in, you know, insisted on it. And uh, it obviously did work because it was our first number one in the States as well. Yeah, I know. Yeah, that showed them. <laughs> yeah. And they also said, oh, well, you can't put guitars on a pop record. And it's like, why not? So, yeah, I mean, we did try and get our way and did get our way most of the time. <laughs> yeah. I loved, I loved it. And if you think back, am I right in saying it's almost 40 years you've yes. been as a band together? Because you've been friends for longer than that. Yeah. yeah. Really yeah. So, so is this, this is one of those rare occasions where it's a band that's made up ultimately of friends, as opposed to you've become friends because you've worked together. Yes. I mean, it, it wasn't a manufactured band. So I guess, yeah, everything seemed, if I must use the word we don't like using, organic. It was very, you know, <laughs> we, went to, we went to clubs, we were friends, and then we put the group together and started writing songs. And yes, it, it was not in any way manufactured. So that's kind of the difference, really. Yeah. So do you, nowadays then, are you still, do you still hang out when you're not working as Bananarama or does work bring you together more? Or do you, I mean, are your kids, do they know each other? Are they friends? Yes. Yeah. They're really yeah. good friends. Um, obviously it's different because uh, Karen lives in Cornwall, I live in London, so we don't see as much of each other. But uh, when we're together, it's just, you know, we're best friends. Yeah. That's so good. I mean, you this year nobody's seen each other. This is as close as anyone's really got anyway. So it's well, we we have been in a bubble throughout. She's really, in a with my family, <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm in a bubble with Sarah's lot because you know working on the book and and stuff. And I will be arriving at Sarah's today in my bubble. Okay, so. look at that's you know the book though. When I was reading it, what I love is the fact that like you've told the story, but it's told from both your perspectives. So it's almost like when, when you're talking to Sarah, there's, it says Sarah, and then it's now your kind of chapter and same with yeah. you, Karen, as well, which is quite a nice way of doing it. 
why did you decide to do the book and why did you decide to do it that way? Well, I think, it, it, you know, do, two people writing a memoir is probably quite unusual and it felt like it, it could only be done as if we were talking and reminiscing um, as a conversation almost. Um, it seemed like it was a really good time to tell our story. Coming up to 40 years, we had a massive year last year, which was brilliant. We had an album and played some really big shows, but to promote our album, we did some very small shows, um, sort of almost like an audience with, and we threw, um, we had an open sort of session with the audience who could ask us anything they wanted. And they were obviously asking us about our childhood together and things we'd done and, and things that, they didn't know about and it just felt like a really good time to actually put it in a book yeah it's you know, there's... a story it is quite a story I think from from sort of our beginnings and sort of early sort of London years where we <laughs> we lived in the most appalling places but had the time of our lives I know there's some brilliant stuff in there I mean if uh, so when people do buy this book you will get your full journey and it's it is great but also if you want to have you know a little bit of the showbiz gossip you've also got little stories there with George Michael haven't you because George Michael on smooth he's one of the most popular artists because you had you did spend a lot of time with him as well yes um we we met him in the very late 80s 90. Um, and became really, really good friends. Um, he lived just up the road from me, so we would have lunch and dinner and play all these different games and go on holidays with him. And to be honest, it was really hard to condense the George Michael chapter <laughs> down to like, oh, we went here, we went there. We, but we just did, you know, we were good friends. So, you know, we spent so much time together. Um, yeah, he's really missed. Yeah, I hope it gives a flavour of, sort of what he meant to us and the relationship we had. Yeah. No, oh, absolutely. Gosh, yeah, I can imagine there's so much, there'd be so much to tell and to pick out from over the years, though. Yeah. So it'd be hard to choose what's in there. And um, in the book, um, I haven't got, I haven't read all of it yet. Do you mention when you meet Robert De Niro? Yes. <laughs> yes. Of course you do. Well, I have to go in, isn't it? I mean, I, this is, I mean, it's amazing. It's, you write a song, Robert De Niro's Waiting, and then you met him. It wasn't the other way around. It wasn't like you were inspired after meeting yeah. him at all. Karen and I loved his films and we were always watching them. So I had a bit of a crush on him, really. And um, we, he just happened to be filming in London at the time. And I guess the PRs got together and said, oh, look, this band have written a song about you. And he called us up in our council flat and asked us out for a drink. Of course, my boyfriend came rushing in and said, oh, Bob De Niro's on the phone. And we, we were didn't be ridiculous. But eventually we went to the phone and uh, ended up going out for a drink. So, yeah, it was really no no that was surreal um it was just bizarre sitting in a in a club you know it was Robert De Niro um very odd so hang on was and what would you chat about because I've interviewed him a few times and he's not the chattiest man in the world <laughs> have you? That's we have no connection I have no idea what we talked about no and that is strange because none of us can remember what was said I know it's a long time ago but um no, we, we can't remember. It's quite funny, though. It's quite a surreal moment, though, isn't it, when you kind of hang out with someone like that as well. And um, when you look back at all the songs and everything that's been released, there are some standout moments. And uh, one of those for me, obviously, were coming up to Christmas, was the fact that you were the only girls that performed with Band-Aid as well. Yeah, us and Jodie Watley. Um, yeah. And then a sea of blokes. <laughs> And then, but you came back as well for Band Aid 2 when it came out as well. Did you sing the same lines? <laughs> I think we just sang the chorus again. <laughs> no, I don't. I think we sang, if I remember rightly, we sang a line in harmony with, I think, uh, it Nick Kamen. Oh, yes. Yes. Do you know what? I've, oh, that's only just come to me. Wow. I must have I, a listen. Yeah, I'm sure we did. I think he sang with us. So we did get a line. Well, well, it was good that you're there representing the girls because I imagine throughout your career, being a girl band in the 80s and 90s, especially in the 80s, a girl band with opinions probably stood out and was probably quite a lot to deal with for, you know, a lot of blokes who weren't used to that. What was it like for girl bands back then? I think for us, um, even as kids, we, we always presumed we could do anything that a boy could do. So we kind of appro approached it quite naturally. And it was only when certain things would 
sort of barriers would come up, we'd sort of think, well, why can't why can't we do that? Or why why are we not getting the respect or the credibility that that, that male bands are getting? But the way we dealt with it is we just continued and made music and carried on and just focused on you know what we did. Yeah, no, I, I completely get that. It makes sense. I and mean, it's brilliant that you did do that because that's what I would, I teach my daughter to be like that now and mm-hmm. don't don't think you can't do something. It's just because um, very much, I imagine that most of the people working behind the scenes, I imagine a lot of them at the top were men as well back then too. Yeah, I think we were quite lucky in our record company because they were very supportive. Um, uh, I think they signed us as an novelty act and it, it worked. So they let us kind of, get on with it and they never tried to make us look a certain way or be a certain way or produce a certain type of music um, because it was working. So we were given sort of independence from them. I think it was in maybe other areas of uh, the business, which was a struggle, but I still think, you know, I think things have changed hugely, but there are a lot of businesses that are still a real boys club. And um, I still think it's harder for women to fight to get to the top. And I, you know, I think when people are being hired, they would take into account, oh, well, we won't hire her because she might want to have to leave and have a baby or, you know, the, all these things come up, I think, and, and, you know, go against men hiring women or, you know, women being able to get to the same position. Yeah. And um, likewise with music in general, I mean, when you were, when you started out, when you were releasing singles, obviously you did phenomenally well. How do you think Bananarama would fare in the music industry now? Because it obviously is a very different place. I think it's quite, I think it's different now for the fact that in, in our day, um, when you release a single, if it's sold, it's sold loads. And I think it's probably much harder for record companies to make money from record sales these days. So they probably want a lot more control over the artists and every aspect of it in order to see their investments pay off maybe. But on the, on the other side, you can record, you're not spending half a million quid in a massive studio recording an album because the equipment is condensed so much. Yeah, which is why last year we decided to self-fund an album and then we got a a hit and it was great. We just did it in our friend's house, his studio. Um, And when you consider how much we used to spend in the 80s on an album, it was a fraction of the price. So in that way, it's it's great. It's moved on. Yeah, absolutely. And what are your plans moving forward, like next year? Everyone's everyone had plans this year that has been pushed back to 2021. Have you got plans for 2021 now? Yes, I mean, most of the shows that we were doing, the festivals and things that were cancelled this year have been rebooked for next year, but it's difficult to say even if next year they'll happen. So um, obviously we've got our 40th anniversary coming up in 2022. um, And so we'll be looking at plans for that. Will there be anything maybe with Siobhan as well for that? Um, I'm not sure because, you know, that was, we did a one-off thing in 2017 and, she she left in 1988 so it really is mine and Karen's celebration of 40 years but you know we don't know I know that's the thing you guys have been a duo for so long yeah. and um actually it's almost like Bananarama is a duo now because I mean that's what it has been for the majority of the time yes I mean that's kind of it was quite strange doing the reunion tour um because I'm so used to just having Karen the other side of me and uh, obviously it wasn't strange for Siobhan because she'd only ever known Bananarama as a trio but for us the majority of time has been as a duo now but you know we were happy to celebrate both things and we had a great time with her back in the day and we certainly enjoyed the reunion tour it was hilarious yeah and um, I want to ask I've been asking a lot of people recently about first gigs just before we before we wrap up do you remember the first time you got on stage as Bananarama and where it was how it felt were you nervous or did you make mistakes I'm trying to think if we were actually called Bananarama at this point, but we we got on stage with a group called the Monochrome Set, and uh, we supported Iggy Pop at the Rainbow in Finsbury Park. Um, were we Bananarama then, Kit? It was the tea set. Yeah, but were we Bananarama at that point? I think we might have been. I think we might have just started. I think the first gigs we did under the name Bananarama were at the Wag Club. Yes. Um, we're at the WAG Club where we used to get up and we had our first demo backing track on a cassette. That's how long ago it was. <laughs> and then we used to have um, sing Frank Sinatra songs with 
a, a group called Subway Sect who were sort of had a thing going every Tuesday, I think it was, Club Left at the WAG. So that was our, I think that was the first time we appeared called Bananarama. We loved the WAG Club. It was the go-to place in the 80s. It was just amazing. And then looking back as well, what would you say is the biggest, most exciting gig that you ever performed? There must be one that you go, that was the best gig that we've done. If I'm perfectly honest, I loved doing the audience with um, mm. last year. It was just, I think it's because it was all our music throughout the 90s and 2000s that Karen and I had done. And we'd never really performed stuff from different albums and then performed you know in stereo that the album from last year I just loved it I really did well I think because it was they, they were smaller venues and we had a Q&A session which mm. was just his, hilarious um with the audience and um yeah we picked songs that we wanted to perform I mean we did some you know hits as well but we essentially we chose the tracks so it was fantastic bringing different tracks to life because Obviously, when you when you're doing festivals, people want mostly hits, which we're really happy with because there's nothing better than, you know, 10, 20,000 people singing along with your music. But yeah, to do different ones, maybe we'll do that for the 40th as well. Yeah, I can't wait to see to see all what you do for the 40th as well. And also that this year, because there's no X Factor on the telly, I'm missing a contestant every now and again popping up singing a banana <laughs> Amazon. Do you ever see that and go, oh God, what are they doing? No, it's brilliant. Well, ho hopefully instead they'll dance to us on Strictly or something. Yeah, there we go. Um, listen, uh, Sarah, Karen, thank you so, so much. It's been lovely chatting. Good luck with the book, Really Saying Something, which is right here. And um, yeah, I hope it goes really, really well. Thank you, Jenny. Thank you. All right. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Bye.